Hello, and welcome back to our series, Learning Music Online. Today, we will be discussing the Romantic era, where the term romance comes from, and where much of what we think of as music originates. We will be focusing much more on individual composers and their lives and what they went through, as opposed to some of the previous episodes, which I will explain later. No discussion of the Romantic era would be complete without discussing the man from which all of the Romantic ideals came from, Ludwig von Beethoven. Born in 1770, Beethoven grew up with Mozart and Haydn as the leading composers of the day. In fact, Beethoven, already a musical genius uh, as a child, would eventually get lessons from Haydn himself, as well as Salieri and others. Over the years, he gained a reputation that allowed him to make money for multiple patrons, publication, as well as public concerts, giving him a level of autonomy that composers before him didn't have. Prior to Beethoven, all composers were reliant on some rich person, some court, some church to provide them funding. Beethoven, because he got funding from multiple places, was not tied down to any one person. This allowed him not only autonomy as far as what he could do uh, professionally, it allowed him autonomy with his music. He was able to compose whatever he wanted as long as people liked it. He was very picky with it, but what he was able to do was totally different and new. In fact, Beethoven was one of the first people, if not really the first major composer, to put his own personal emotions into the music. Composers that came before him had emotion in the music, but the emotion was always tied to either the patron, who was asking for them to write this piece, or for some specific event, or it was about a story. They could portray emotion, but it was not their own. Beethoven was the first person to put his own personal struggles into his music, oftentimes outlining his struggle with not only his romantic life being less than stellar, but also some of his professional difficulties, as well as the largest looming issue that sort of encompassed his whole life in the loss of his hearing. Now, obviously, as a composer and as a musician, losing your hearing is a major deal. It's sort of what you make your money from. And as Beethoven lost his hearing, he grew more and more despondent. The despair became overwhelming, and he continuously put it into his music, composing well after he had lost his hearing. To portray these growing emotions and to continually push what he viewed as his own abilities and the limitations of the medium, he expanded the amount of instruments needed for his pieces, the length of the pieces, the harmonic structure of the pieces, and through this relayed the groundwork for what future composers would do as far as changing the realm of what was right or acceptable within music composition. This would lead to somewhat of a cult of personality, meaning people knew Beethoven as Beethoven. He was the most famous composer of his day, Haydn having passed before him, but Beethoven was the single most known composer. People sought after Beethoven, they idolized Beethoven, they knew some of his struggles, not necessarily the deafness, which was kept under wraps, but some of his other struggles, and he had this mystical quality to his personality that other composers before him never really had, being mostly, again, like I said, church composers or court composers. Composers that came after would always seek out this same sort of stature, this same magnificence of character. And it would guide and change everything that they did and the way that they approached music and everything else. Brahms was even quoted as once saying, I shall never compose a symphony. You have no idea how someone like me feels when he hears such a giant marching behind him all the time. This was the reach that Beethoven had, covering all the composers that came after him. Before we get to those composers, we have to talk about the political goings-ons and the technological happenings of the day. So this, this era of the 1770s, obviously you had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, you had other smaller revolutions, you had kingdoms coalescing. In Europe at this time, there were dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of small kingdoms, each led by their own duke, their own king, their own whoever they might be. As the 1700s progressed into the 1800s, they began to coalesce. Uh, Spain had famously united in the 1500s under uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. France had united 
quite some time before. But through the 1800s, you had German states coming together. You had different states around Poland and these places that had been loose collections of kingdoms coalescing now into actual countries and forming more of what we recognize as modern day Europe. This led to a reliance less on individual kings and more on the populace of a country. It led to a sense of national identity that would grow and eventually start infecting the music and even some of the political beliefs, whether good or bad. This also led to a gathering in cities as cities expanded as technology grew and it became more feasible to work in factories rather than working on farms as the money became greater, you had people form what was called the middle class. This was a group of people that, unlike in the past, had both disposable income, meaning money they could spend on things that weren't necessities, and extra time. As people gained rights, they were able to demand shorter working hours, better pay, and this led to a flourishing of hobbies, one of which, of course, was music. This led to, you know, not, not only a growing sense of community and everything that comes with that, but also a culture of lessons, of compositions for amateurs, which actually started in the classical era, but would only grow as cities grew with technology. This individualism really leads the way into what comes next with the composers. Because of this growing sense of individuality and writing for amateurs and people who had now pianos that were affordable and music lessons, composers like Franz Schubert and Robert Schumann began writing something called Lieder, one of the most important, especially early romantic kinds of music. Lieds, which literally means song in German, were shorter pieces, maybe a couple minutes long. They usually focused on some emotion or a scene. Schubert, uh, for instance, having received lessons from Salieri, which you, if you recall, Beethoven also received lessons from, wrote um, Winterreise, Der Lindenbaum, Der Atlas, these leads that still to this day are incredibly popular. He also wrote the Wanderer Fantasy, which expanded harmonically, textually, what you could do with music. And many composers after would look back to this Wanderer Fantasy and take a lot of ideas for experimentation for themselves, obviously taking it farther than Schubert did, having come first, but still equal in spirit and in ingenuity. Robert Schumann, who grew up while Schubert was popular, was much more eccentric than Schubert was, and his life ended much more tragically. He actually paved the way for this idea of composers suffering, composers eventually dying, sadly in that informing their music. This idea had begun with Beethoven, of course with his loss of hearing, putting his struggles into his music, but Robert Schumann's mental health actually deteriorated later in his life until he had to be put in a mental institution for the rest of his life. His wife Clara Schumann, who in her own right was a great composer and performer, also on piano, same as Robert Schumann, was the one who made all the money because Robert Schumann just wanted to compose. So Clara would give lessons, she would do concerts, and she made the money so that Robert could do his thing. Now the year after they got married, he had his year of leader. He wrote 120 leader in one year. That's about three a day. Three fully fleshed out complex pieces that had an overarching stories and, in, and were interconnected with each other, which is just mind boggling. But not only was his inventiveness key to the composers that would come later, but he really laid the groundwork for this idea of the artist suffering not only from imagined or physical illnesses, but mental illnesses as well, as for good or for bad. On the flip side of Schubert and Schumann, who both, while they wrote within the context of their predecessors, always pushed the boundaries, you had Felix Mendelssohn, who preferred to write within those bounds exclusively. He wrote sonatas, he wrote symphonies, he wrote these things that Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn had all become famous for and didn't push the boundaries there as much. Instead, choosing to, within these styles and within these genres, 
you push the boundaries in other ways with what emotion you could express with it, how you could expand it. It's essentially a direct continuation of Beethoven's train of thought. You know, Beethoven was not trying to completely reinvent music as we knew it with completely new things. He just added something to it, which is the route that Mendelssohn took. This idea would eventually carry over to Brahms later in the Romantic era, who we will get to, I believe, next video. Another composer at the time who decided to take a different route, whereas Schumann, Schubert did leads, Mendelssohn took older styles of music. Frederick Chopin wrote almost exclusively for piano. He was also famous for taking his native Polish music, he was Polish, and writing those melodies into his music. In the past, people had used folk music, it had existed, they had written pieces about it, but Chopin brought mazurkas, he brought these strictly Polish dances to great popularity, using his skill on piano, and made them popular all over Europe and even in other continents as well. He was also a master teacher, writing etudes, which are little exercises, and pieces specifically for his students, things that would show off their skills while still teaching them something, while still playable for them. And these etudes, these lessons that he wrote, are still used to this day. He was also one of the first composers, alongside Clara Schumann, to use the word ballad to describe an instrumental piece. Ballads had been used before, of course, vocally, to describe a pretty song. You know, you know what a ballad is, essentially. But to use it to describe an instrumental piece was new. And this would open the door for later composers to also use more interesting, more descriptive names, uh, even less concrete names, to describe the music and gave them a wider palette of emotions and colors and scenes with which they could paint. Perhaps the most influential composer for the modern era is Franz Liszt, a virtuosic piano player who really laid out much of what we view as modern concert etiquette, and the lives of basically every music student in the world. Liszt created the concept of a recital, which is something that we think of as just being things that you do, right? Professional musicians go and they play a recital. You have a dance recital. You have any one of many kinds of recitals that you can do. Well, that word was first used by Franz Liszt. He wanted to be the most virtuosic piano player. He wanted to push the bounds of this instrument that at the time was still being developed and added to and perfected. As they added things to it, he would figure out ways to use it. And along with his natural skill and work ethic, was able to do incredible things that made him the rock star of his day. The fervor that would follow him at his concerts was actually very reminiscent of modern rock bands or hip-hop artists or pop groups who have their rabid fans throwing themselves at the musician. Liszt also changed the idea of what music was acceptable to be played. Whereas prior to him, most music was relatively modern. You'd play music from the people around you, or you'd even play your own music if you were also a composer in order to show people so they'd want to buy it. Liszt played older music as well as modern music. He played Bach, he played Mozart, he played Beethoven's music, and he played his own music and those of his contemporaries. He also arranged for piano versions of orchestra pieces, of symphonies, and other things, which was something that people hadn't really done before, but it helped to spread these compositions and spread his renown as a piano player by being able to do all of these things. The last thing that he did that many, 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 many people uh, I wouldn't say despise him for, but could sort of argue against, is that he would play all of his recitals from memory, and it's now the standard to play recitals from memory. I never did, and some people don't, even you know professionals, but it is the culture to play from memory, and that started as well with Franz Liszt. Now, up to this point, we have been discussing individual composers almost exclusively. And in the Romantic era, because of the focus on the individual, because of their followings and their name recognition, it's impossible to separate the composers from the styles that they coined, from the things that they did that are so associated with them. We're going to take a break from that for just a second and focus on what was going on with the symphony at this time. If you notice, we've talked about piano pieces, we've talked about dances, written for piano, we've talked about things written for singers, 
to sing in the home, but we haven't really discussed large-scale works, and that's because at this time, large-scale works were not as feasible. They were still done, but the focus was much more on smaller works, more individualized things that people could do more easily, and that was more affordable to sell. Whereas with a lead, you could do a whole concert of leader, and you only need one person. Maybe one, maybe two people, singer and a piano player. With a symphony, you need 60, 70 people, and you need to pay all of them, you need to pay the composer, and it's just much more financially difficult, as well as timing and things like that for rehearsals. So while symphonies fell out of popular favor a little bit, among composers, the symphony was still viewed as the epitome of music. It was still viewed as the medium through which they would push themselves and grow everything that they did. This was also the time during which the concert etiquette that we've come to know really formed. In the 1700s, it was acceptable to talk, to laugh, to clap during a performance, but during the Romantic era, during the 1800s, and actually in large part due to Liszt and his recitals, it became much more common for audiences to remain quiet, to listen, as especially symphonies, but all pieces became much more thought-driven. And to understand a Bach piece, you really only need to know either the words or you just need to understand the general character of a piece. The same thing with Mozart. In the Romantic era, people started putting so much thought into individual melodies, they started putting characters into their pieces and stories, that you had to actually really pay attention in order to understand why the piece was written the way that it was. Again, this made it less widely popular, because it required more thought, it was a little more elitist, it was harder to do, but it made it deeper and richer because of it. One particular symphony that revolutionized the era was Hector Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique. Berlioz, who was one of the only composers who couldn't play piano, instead choosing to play flute and guitar, which he actually credits as being the reason he was able to compose the way that he did, wrote a piece that actually had a program with it, a written set of words to read while the piece was happening. So prior to this, a piece either had words and told a story, or it was written to portray an idea, some sort of trope. This is a heroic piece. There's some hero overcoming something. This is about a death. You can hear someone being sad about dying. There's this one that's about hope, or this is about, this, or this is a dance, even. But Symphony Fantastique told a story, a specific purposeful story all the way through, in a way that hadn't been done this through thread before. Again, having characters is one thing, but having action and emotion affect the actual music without any sung words was something that had never ever been done before. This would lead to a deep divide in the music community between what was called programmatic music, meaning music written to paint a scene, to tell a story, with characters and events, and absolute music, which was music written for music's sake. Now, these two kinds of music were not completely mutually exclusive. Obviously, by definition, they're different, but it's always possible to analyze something as having characters and having thoughts, and it's possible to sort of do something in between the two, where maybe there is a character doing something, but it's not a full story, or maybe it's hinting at a story. Maybe the composer had something in mind that he wanted to tell, or she wanted to tell, or they wanted to tell, but didn't specifically write a story with it. Things can be programmatic without necessarily being program music. But even to this day, this divide would lead to arguments and writing and different papers and things as to which one, sometimes people would even argue which one is better, but oftentimes just what a piece really is. And going into the modern era, the 1950s, and even later to the present day, you still have this expansion onto what is programmatic music, what is absolute music. Can you make music completely devoid of story? Can you make music purely for music's sake? Which we will eventually get to in musique concrète, probably next class. We will go ahead and stop there for today because getting towards the end of the Romantic era leads us directly into the modern era. So thank you all for joining us. I love you all. Stay safe, drink your water, take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time.